thanks a lot to the organizer for the for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to to talk. It's an honor. Well, I don't know if I deserve it. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be talking about black holes. But next week, Bo uh, Sandborg will talk about black holes and how you spin. So, I, ho I hope you you will be there next week. Instead, I will talk about, as you see, linearized high spin dynamics, but it will be in three dimensions, and I will try to make it most of the time in ADS3, so, so as to stick to the, to the theme of the program. And I will talk about a recent work in collaboration with my colleagues in Mons, Thomas Basil and Roberto Bonetzi. And I will also present, uh, review some older results which were obtained in collaboration with Mikia Ponomarev, Ergin, Sesgin, and Per Sundel. So the, mo the motivation I, I could see is that 3D space-time, they admit a rich variety of dynamics, of fundamental systems. In fact, richer than in, in higher dimensions. So either topological degrees of freedom, Chan Simons, or propagating degrees of freedom. Obviously, another important motivation for me here in this talk is the gabardil gopakuma conjecture that relates uh, higher spin theory in the bulk ADS3 to uh, minimal models that they spelled out in detail, and I don't need, of course, to, to review here. It's not the place, but that's clearly my, my motivation. So it's believed that the bulk dynamics is governed by the Prokushkin-Vasiliev interac interacting system, so which consists of an infinite tower of higher spin fields which interact with, uh, with matter. Matter field is there. So, but this is still, I mean, to, to make the precise connection between the minimal model, the CFT2, and the Prokushkin-Vasiliev is not yet uh, completely understood. And also something which doesn't exist uh, to my knowledge is a fully nonlinear extension of topologically massive gravity to higher spin. So in the sense that there we, we have one well, topologically massive gravity as one bulk graviton propagating. So it could be tempting to try to generalize this to higher spin as well and having also propagating spin S degrees of freedom in the bulk. Because this TMG admits interesting black hole solutions. So this is clearly a motivation. So could it be possible to have a higher spin analog of that? That's a motivation. But all I will do here will be very humble for this last talk of the week. Everything will be free and so <laughs> linear systems. In fact, in 3D, there is another motivation. But uh, okay, I will not talk about that is that uh, two plus one dimensional system also accommodate fractional spin fields. Actually, with my colleagues, Mauricio Valenzuela and Per, we have been building interacting systems that unify 3D higher spin gravity with an internal UN gauge field system uh, via the fractional spin field, which act as matter field. But okay, I will really not talk about interacting systems here. Another part of uh, my collaboration involves uh, act writing action principles for prokushkin vasiliev's equation. I already talked about that elsewhere. So here I really want to make it simple. And as I said, unfortunately, there will not be any black hole here. So uh, indeed, I would like to classify to show you what are the kinds of beasts that you can find in ADS3 propagating degrees of freedom. And also the non-propagating, but this you know already very well. So the way I, I approach this classification of propagating degrees of freedom in ADS3 is via the unfolding formulation. It's a Carton formulation of a dynamical system where all the local degrees of freedom are encapsulated into zero forms. And that's really the very useful and important tool that has been introduced by Mikhail Vasiliev here. So, oh, as I said, the local degrees of freedom for relativistic theory are contained into Lorentz zero forms, so Lorentz tensors, and all together they carry the unitary irreducible representation of the background isometry algebra. So, 
these technologies make the identification of the local degrees of freedoms really systematic. Of course, it also makes possible the, the construction of fully nonlinear higher spin theories, high spin equations. So here I will I would like to give higher spin generalizations of or various highest derivative extension of gravity, including the critical versions with their typical logarithmic modes. Okay, I will have to give a bit of um, notation. At first, I wanted to make a blackboard talk. I didn't know I would have the privilege to give a talk in this um, uh, setup, but it's a bit like a blackboard talk. So for my notation, uh, the, the ADS isometry algebra is decomposed this way, and the mass operator in the signature that I choose is there, minus p squared. So these are the generators that I take emission of the isometry algebra with the two time directions, zero prime and zero. The transvection generators are the zero prime A component, and they obey this uh, commutation relation with the Lorentz generators and the metric, which is the mostly plus. So the Lorentz covariant derivative, one form, is there. So the two, for, for the two SL2R algebras, they are embedded in this way, in terms of the Lorentz and the transvection generators of ADS, where this parameter epsilon takes plus or minu minus value. As usual, one dualizes the Lorentz generators in three dimensions, so the mass operator can be written as the difference of the two quadratic Casimirs, the one of the isometry algebra and the one of the Lorentz subalgebra with these conventions. As is customary, one introduced the compact ba basis of raising and lowering operators and the energy here. I try to keep the um, cosmological constant as much as possible in the, in the slides, but uh, at some point I will set it to one. Okay, and then you have the, you recognize your beloved uh, commutation relations. Where well, spin is given here in my conventions by minus the sum of the time-like components of the two SO21 algebras, <coughs> and the energy is given by the difference. Well, maybe this is not so conventional in, uh, in CFT. That's my well, so as I said, for un in unfolding, all the local degrees of freedom are captured by an infinite tower of Lorentz tensors. So they are zero forms. Yeah. By Lorentz, I mean that not, they are not only totally symmetric here in these in three dimensions, but they are traceless. And well, they obey this equation for here for a scalar field. You can unfold uh, the scalar field system, a free scalar massive in ADS in this set. So you see that all these tensors, you have an infinite tower, the rank is more and is higher and higher. Okay, for the notation, we use, we often use this convention to denote a rank S totally symmetric tensor. And they are all related. You see the tensor at level N uh, talks via the Lorentz covariant derivative of, of the ADS background to the tensor at next order in this tower and also to itself or, and to the one at order at one or the below. So, I mean, you, you take the paper by Misha and you, you find these are all papers that this describes a scalar field in ADS. Now for higher spin fields, you can also introduce an extra term here. So if the parameter S, which of course will be the spin of the fundamental propagating mode, is strictly positive, then you have the possibility to add this extra piece, which uses the epsilon symbol in three dimensions. And again, the tensor at, nev at level n talks to the tensor at level n plus one, with this extra index b. It talks to itself via this, this term with the parameter mu, which has a dimension of a mass. And it talks to the tensors at the previous level. So now the Carton integrability of these equations fixes this constant. You don't have the choice. That's Carton integrability. And that describes a massive spin S field, and I will describe it in, in quite details. Probably for some of you it will be boring, but okay, I want to, to describe that. So when mu is zero, 
one recognizes the linearized Prokushkin-Vasilev equation at the critical point, nu, which takes an odd integer value, where nu in the notation of Vasilev is related to the lambda parameter, to the HS lambda uh, notation, here in this way with my convention. So that's a, for sure an extra motivation why we looked at this system is because we also would like to understand the linearization of prokushkin vasiliev better at the critical point. It turns out to be quite subtle to study uh, these equations at the critical point. So here there is an indecomposable structure. You see that these coefficients there that I call lambda n, they can vanish for some, for some value of the mass parameter mu. So at this stage, this mass parameter uh, is arbitrary. But you see that when this parameter takes these values, product of s times s prime, and s prime start at s plus one, then you have the vanishing of the coefficient lambda s prime, which means that the tensor there, phi a n, is not calling the, pr the previous one anymore. It stops. And then you have an ideal which closes, which starts with this phi s prime, where, where n, the index n, is s prime, up to infinity. And the tensors which are in between, from s to s prime plus one, they are left alone, and they form a finite dimensional representation. So the, stru the indecomposable structure is the following, is that you have this, the ideal with all the tensors from the rank, well, in fact, s prime to infinity, and then you are left with here a finite dimensional module from s to s prime minus one. Ah, okay, so here I took the example where the first pos possibility when s prime is s plus one. In this case, this finite dimensional set is only comprises only this tensor. Then you can do the standard group theory analysis. Here everything is very standard. The primary tensor, so the one which is the first in this tower of zero forms, it obeys this D'Alembert-like equation with a critical mass given there. And the box de la place de Beltrami of, of ADS3. So for the scalar field, M0 that I introduced before was, of course, was indeed the mass. And you recognize a massive Klein-Gordon field, whereas for spin greater than zero, you find that the, the value of the quadratic Casimir takes this value, and well, and the mass, the mass is there. Okay, so now if you look at the equation for the, the first one in your, in your tower, that's what you have. You don't call the, the tensor at previous order because there is no tensor, so the first one has only this, these two pieces for strictly positive S, and by manipulating you find that it implies the divergence-less constraint on, on it. Well, it is traceless definition to begin with, and this is the ADS3 uh, background metric. And then it obeys this differential equation of the first order. And for spin two, you recognize that this is linearized topologically massive gravity. Uh, notice that because of that, which results from this equation, you don't need to symmetrize the indices new over there. This quantity is already completely symmetric in the indices new. So this system of equation can actually be generalized where we have these two parameters, alpha and beta, that can be taken to be within this range between zero and one. So that by playing, by tuning these values of alpha and beta, you can change the indecomposable structure. So, uh, for example, if you take what, what I presented in the pre previous slides, corresponded to alpha and beta being zero, in particular for beta is zero, the ideal, which is closed under the action of the Lorentz covariant derivative, was, as I said, this infinite tower starting at spin s prime, which was which is bigger than s, up to infinity. Whereas if you take beta is one in this equation, you can see that the ideal, which is closed on the, the covariant derivative, of, uh, is this set, is the finite dimensional set of tensors from rank S to S prime minus one. Okay, 
but I will, I will keep the convention with alpha and beta, which are both zero. So what about the spectrum and unitarity? Well, as usual, you, you compute the module, the irreducible modules of the SO22 isometry algebra, where E0 is the minimal energy of your lowest energy uh, representation. S0 is the helicity of the vacuum, the SO2 spin. And in the case of the scalar field, uh, you, you know very well the critical value, the lowest energy for the scalar field in ADS3, where you have the unitarity in ADS, where this parameter now I go to two dimension where instead of two, you can go to little d here. So okay, it, picking two, you have from here this minus one up to infinity. This is a unitary field. The mass squared can be a bit negative. This is the brighton loner friedman bound. And th the quadratic Casimir of the representation you are describing in general is given here. Of course, in the case of the scalar field, here this piece is zero. And you recognize this typical uh, part, this piece is of the Casimir of the uh, isometry algebra. So, okay, that's for spin zero. For the, um, for the higher spin system, where there is this parameter mu which is activated, this one was not allowed by integrability for spin zero. You, you have from this equation that the critical, the lowest energy of your vacuum of your module and the spin are as follows. Or if you change the parity, then you have minus s LCT, and then the energy is minus mu over s plus one in the case where mu is negative. So in the following, I will, uh, without loss of generality, assume mu is positive. And unitarity, uh, uh, as you know, I will just recall, implies that the value of the critical energy should be greater or equal to the absolute value of the LCT, which in this case means that mu, which up to now was uh, arbitrary, should satisfy this bound. And in fact, this bound is saturated for the singleton, the spin S singleton in ADS3, which has indeed critical energy S and LCT S. Yeah, just recall, in the case of SO2D, what is the, <laughs> the bound on unitarity? And, and for scalar field, and, and for, sorry, for mu is zero, unitarity requires that you have the spin one singleton. So now if you go to the compact basis and the labels of the two SL2R uh, subalgebras of SO22, maybe it's better now, you, you can represent equally well this module in terms of critical energy in terms of the labels of the two SL2R, the plus and the left. And you find these two these two possibilities in the case where mu is strictly positive and when mu is negative, you have these other two possibilities. As usual, you have a, a characteristic equation, you have a quadratic equation, so there are two solutions, J for the, um, associated with the um, uh, Casimir relation, but here you must have that the sum of the two should be an integer because you start from tensorial fields on ADS3. So you don't, you, you cannot play with that. What you are, you are doing here is unfolding a, bos a tensor field and bosonic, by the way. In 94, Michel, that Fermanic case. So here, the, um, the lowest energy representations with the convention that I gave for the compact um, algebra, they are given by a tensor product of a lowest weight representation of the SO12 plus, tensor the uh, highest weight representation of SO12 minus. So again, you have critical points when mu can take those values. I recall the unitarity bound. So just to discuss these critical points, as I said, you have the appearance of finite dimensional modules at these points. Uh, I take a concrete example where S prime is S plus one, which is the first po possible case. Then the two labels of the two SO to one algebras take these values, namely one and minus S minus one. It means that for the SO21 algebra plus, the module you have here is that you have one, and then you have a lowest weight module for the J plus algebra. So it means that you have all this weight from one to up to infinity contained in your module. But you are left, because, this, because one is integer and positive, you are left with this, uh, this mode. 
for the second, for the SO21 uh, minus algebra, here it's a highest weight module with a negative highest weight state, so you fill all these dots below this, this line, but you are left with a finite dimensional module here. You have this indecomposable stru structure that I explained on the, on the equations bef before, previously, which, which is there. So this finite dimensional module is the tensor product of the two, because of the two SO21, and you can compute its dimension. You can see that indeed it, it, it contains all the components of these tensors there. Okay, so as I said here, the values corresponding, in the general case, if you don't take S plus one anymore for S prime, in general, you have an indecomposable structure and you can read what is the finite dimensional module R from these two, these two weights. So if you, if you quotient, if you stay inside the ideal, in, inside the infinite dimensional I ideal, here in this case, you have critical energy S plus two for spin S which is the, the tensor product of the two discrete series of each of the um, SO21 plus and minus algebras. This lowest weight um, unitary reducible discrete series here, the D plus, and you have the D minus for the SO21 minus, associated with spin minus S minus one. Okay, so again, the singletons are interesting points there. I recall the unitarity bound. This bound is saturated um, to give the singleton, precisely the, the spin S singleton. If you recall, if you remember the formula for the critical mass, at this value of the parameter mu, you, f you find this D'Alembert-like equation for the primary uh, zero form tensor, the first tensor in your, cha in your chain of uh, zero forms. And again, I recall that this tensor is divergence-less and traceless. So to conclude this, um, this first part, uh, the, the point is that the modules, which are described by all these equations, these unfolded equations, this has a critical energy, so they are lowest energy unitary irreducible representations, unitary in that, in that case, and they describe the degrees of freedom of a spin S genera generalization of topologically massive gravity. Actually, the equation I presented at the beginning, which coupled all these, uh, this, this infinite tower of zero form, is not the most general one. Actually, the most general set of equations that you can write for a system of zero forms includes a label, an extra label, on all these zero forms. So now you can play and have several, well, infinite towers in the case of propagating degrees of freedom, uh, each for n going from s up to infinity. So what were the coefficients, mu n and lambda n of some of the slides before? They now become matrices. And again, Carton integrability fixes everything for you. You don't have the choice. What you find from Carton integrability is that these two matrices must commute for all n. And again, spin zero is, the, is to be taken separately, treated separately from the strictly positive case you find for the scalar fields that this mass matrix is zero and that these coefficients are given by, by that. In the case of strictly positive spin, you find this value for the mass matrix, matrix and these are the coefficients. Clearly you recover what you had before in the case of a, of a single tower. Again, you do the little group theory analysis. You compute what is the mass squared operator on each of your tower, zero form tower, and you find <coughs> this value, which now is not necessarily diagonal because the matrix mu, uh, well, Carton integrability didn't fix mu to be diagonal, actually. So you have still some freedom, so, uh, some place where you can play. So for the scalar fields, the lowest uh, element in the tower, which is a scalar field, obeys this equation, whereas for the spin S field, the primary zero form, so the lowest spin element in this infinite tower, they have to satisfy this set of equations. Each of them, again, as follows from the equations, 
are divergence-less, and by construction, they are traceless. And now we can recover various cases and generalize various cases studied in the literature in the case of spin two and spin one. For example, if you take this as the mass matrix there, and you, you take two towers of zero forms, then the equations that uh, I wrote before at the first level for minimum spin S here are as follows. If you express phi two in terms of phi one and plug back into these equations, you find a second order equation for phi one, which I call here now this uh, capital phi. And again, for here for spin two, you recognize that this is the equation for linearized new massive gravity. So this equation, this system generalizes new massive gravity to um, arbitrary higher spin. Well, here uh, everything linearized, unfortunately. But that's the first step. Okay, then this, the equation, the second order equation, factorizes like this, where as usual in this context of uh, ADS3, uh, you introduce this differential operator, which here I still keep the cosmological constant in the game. There is a delta Kronecker, and then you have the, the curl operator contracted with the epsilon symbol. Uh, so this tensor there is also rank S if phi is rank S. It is also traceless and divergenceless if phi was traceless and divergenceless. So it maintains you in the space of traceless and divergenceless tensors. So the wave equation there now has obviously solutions that are linear combinations of these two solutions, where here these two, these plus and minus phi s are nothing but the sum and the difference of the two elements in this double tower, uh, this phi one and phi two. You take sum and difference. So again, it's quite straightforward to identify what are the propagating, propagating modes. Now, what for higher spin generalizations of generalized massive gravity? Now you, you take a mass matrix, in this case, which is, um, well, in the previous case it was uh, diagonal. Well, you could diagonalize it to m and minus m, but I presented it in off-diagonal form. But okay, suppose now mu is diagonal and with different eigenvalues, m1 up to mn. Then you, you find that the system that you describe, uh, the solutions satisfy this set of equa this equation. And in the case n equals two, we recovered the, the case before. Well, in general, you cannot diagonalize you, but the, the most you can do is to bring it to a sum of Jordan blocks. And so here, a Jordan block of size uh, R, R times R is there. So if the mass matrix, which now is the, the most general one, if you consider this, sub, uh, this Jordan block, you have this set of equations, index i going from one to R minus one, and you see that you always couple the phi i plus one to the phi i, and then until the last uh, primary zero, zero form in this uh, set, which obeys this equation. Again, you can recursively eliminate uh, phi i plus one in terms of phi i until phi one that I re rename like this. And so you find this set of equation, well, this equation of order a, so it's a differential operator of order one, but to the power r, which is a higher spin, well, the higher spin generalization of 3D critical massive gravity. So on top of the spin S unit mode, which is there, it, al it also possesses p-fold logarithmic solutions for p going from one to r minus one. So it, of course, it would be interesting to have an interacting theory which uses those fields. Thank you. Okay, now the problem of the gauge potentials, because all that was at the level of zero forms, and because I, I, I told you, and you can believe me, that the zero forms uh, carry all the local degrees of freedom. But now the question of interactions or action principle uh, necessitates the introduction of potentials. And here you have various choices. Uh, and I will present three different types of choices of potential uh, that you can glue, so to speak, that you can attach to these towers of zero forms. That will, of course, not 
do anything to the counting of degrees of freedom that we identified here. But as I said, you will probably recognize some of the equations you have, you have played uh, in the case of spin two and spin one in the past. And clearly, we have to be open to several possibilities of, of uh, gauge potential modules because interactions may require one and not the other. Okay, so I will first discuss the case where the zero form, the primary zero form, will be related to a set of potentials where you will recognize the Franz Dahl tensor, which is double traceless spin S field. Then I will show you that you can also glue the system of zero forms to a David Friedman, well, to a curvature of David Friedman, which uh, is written in terms of an unconstrained, so no trace constraints on this rank S totally symmetric gauge potential. And finally, I will uh, briefly discuss conformal uh, spin S field in three dimensions. Because again, the, the unitary irreducible module of SO22 will, is always the same, but you can describe it in terms of various uh, types of potentials. And depending on the choice of potential you make, the field equation will be of order three in derivatives, or of order S plus one in derivatives, or of order two S uh, minus one derivatives. In fact, there is a minus one. Ah, no, but there is an extra one. Okay, I will come back to that. Okay, so first, in, 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 in terms of Franz Dahl potentials, so as Misha did very long ago in the early 80s for spin S field, you introduce these two connections. So in three dimensions, you don't have more connections like this if they are to be valued in SO3, because SO3 cannot accommodate more young tableau than these ones. And you also have the background uh, modules with the background dry, dry bind and spin connection. So indeed, so this one is one form completely symmetric in S minus one indices and traceless, and this is one form which transforms in this representation of SO12, the Lorentz SO12. Okay, in the case of a single tower of zero form, which was carrying the degrees of freedom of spin S, of topologically massive spin S, the set of equations uh, that you are led to propose very naturally is this one. So you see again, first of the differential equation, only wedge product comes. I don't write, by the way, the wedge product here. It's implicit. And then you recognize the equation that I started my talk with. After this equation, there is an infinite set of equations, but now I don't recall them. That was the first part of the talk. But we know that all the tensors at all the high orders, all together, they carry the, the degrees of freedom. So here, integrability in the one form sector requires that this parameter tau should be uh, given by that value. This, the field equations are of the form zero torsion, the first one, and that allows you to express the first connection in terms of the first one form in your set. You inject that in the second equation, and you find that the equation equals the Franz Dahl tensor to this primary zero form that we discussed separately during the first part of the talk. And I recall the expression of the Franz Dahl tensor. He need, yes. And now I'm setting lambda to one. So the Franz Dahl potential, uh, as always, is given by this projection of the one form. So this was the, in the one form, the index of the one form E. These were the frame SO21 indices that you have brought to base indices using the background dry bind. And because of that, you can see that the tensor satisfy indeed the double trace constraint of Franz Dahl. Now the equations of motion of the zero form system that I gave you, they impose two things. First, because that is traceless by definition, it imposed that the trace of the Franz Dahl tensor should be zero. And then the equation that you remember, which has one derivative and that you can write in terms of this curly D operator, where, where the mass parameter enters here. And you remember all the discussions uh, I, I, I made with the, uh, the degrees of freedom. So in fact, pre previously in the literature, people discussed only the second equation, but if you don't have the first one, uh, you will propagate also a spin S minus two mode, which will not have the same sign as the spin S mode. So it's very important to have that. And it's a nice byproduct of the unfolding approach that it comes automatically. So for spin one, you have a topologically massive photon, spin one, Generalized topo topologically massive gravity. 
some remarks. In higher dimension than three, in four dim dimensions, the lopatin vasiliev system set the France dial tensor to zero, not its trace. And the last curvature constraint, if you want, relates S derivatives of the France dial like potential to the primary zero form, which transforms in the Young tableau of the Lorentz group, which is there. So here in three dimensions, it's, it's different. The zero form now is related, is attached to the Franzal tensor itself with two derivatives and not to the traceless part of the Riemann-like tensor, which has S derivatives. Then second, second remark is that using now gauge invariance, uh, you can fix the gauge and bring the equations in this form where the tensor is traceless and the divergence-less and obeys this third order equation of motion. You have two derivatives plus one there. Again, if you expand phi the potential in modes, you find that there are these three modes which are propagating. Well, in fact, those two ones are not propagating because they are the spin S singletons. They are the solution of the equation where this is the wave equation. But then you have the, the massive uh, mode of spin S which is propagating. So these two modes now are the boundary modes from this equation, which is the just the Franzal equation uh, when you fix the gauge. And they are carried by the potential module, by the one forms. This was the mode carried by the zero forms. In the limit when the mass goes to zero, this mass parameter, you have that the massive modes degenerates to, to this, which is non-unitary non -unitary for spin strictly greater than one. And is the spin S analog of the one comma two states in conformal chain Simon's gravity, uh, well, which happens to be in the partially massless field. So you have the death two here. This parameter T uh, is two, and little d is two, is also two for ADS three, and that was studied by these authors there. So here you have the spin S generalization of that. Now about the unconstrained potentials. Well, you can now relax the, um, the choice of SO3 as a kind of fiber algebra, but you, take, you can take GL3. In this way, although you are in three dimensions, you can accommodate all this family of one form uh, connections where T goes from zero to S minus one, because they are no longer identically zero. Well, it's not so difficult to write an unfolded system where the last is always the same as before. And here, Carton integrability requires that this parameter takes these values. Now, because you have written the system in unfolded form, the gauge invariance is manifest, and you can define now the unconstrained potential from the first connection, which is now GL3 valued. So it doesn't, this tensor doesn't obey the double tra trace constraints anymore. It is unconstrained. So the equation that the system describes now are there, where R Tweedle is just the dual of the Riemann-like tensor in ADS, which starts with S derivatives of your potential. So the equation of motion here is about the S plus one. So here you have one derivative, and this tensor R Tweedle effectively contains up to S derivatives of the potential. So the study, the, the degrees of freedom of this system was studied by, by these authors for spin two and spin three. And that was not so easy uh, for, to do. Here, via the unfolded, uh, the unfolding approach, it's, there is uh, nothing to discuss. I mean, it has been done. Okay, then you can play with the extension of two towers of zero forms, and you find that now the resulting equations are um, like that, where you recognize, again, new massive spin S in terms of this single potential. And again, the degrees of freedom are manifest. You know what you are describing. You don't have to fix gauge and to play around. That's uh, automatic. So now the question is, well, in terms of this representation of the zero form, namely by the traceless part of the Riemann-like tensor here, the divergence constraints on the zero form is automatic because you, you acted with enough derivatives here as derivatives of your potential. But is there a way to make the trace constraints also an identity? And yes, and uh, it requires to use another one form module. Okay, that should be okay. And well, again, well, this is uh, not known, but in fact, Ben Clinton and his students have studied this uh, quite thoroughly. And more recently, we have looked at that again uh, in a slightly different way. 
So the cotton tensor is indeed identically traceless and divergenceless. So it's a good candidate for the zero form uh, of, your of your module of zero forms. So if you follow uh, these authors and maybe go to some different notations, you the spin S conformal field is described by a one form valued in this, in this module of SO23, the conformal algebra in three dimensions. And generalizations have been provided by these authors here and there. For general case of SO2D, you, you give a conformal uh, unitary or not unitary module of SO2D, and you can write a set of unfolded equations that will carry via the zero forms all the degrees of freedom. But here I'm doing it the very simplest case, uh, but maybe we enlarge this module to a GL5 module, because we would like to continue on, on this idea that even you are in, in three dimensions, it's useful to have a set of one form connections which have two rows and the second row can be bigger than one. So it's useful to keep track of the derivative that you're acting recursively on the, on the first potential, the Franz Dahl-like potential. So in fact, we extended SO2D, well here SO23 to GL5. And okay, maybe I will skip again that this is quite standard and usual to do in a higher spin setup. So you go to light cone directions for SO23 with the usual, I, I hope, conventions. Now we have the SO23 generators where we have introduced two sets of oscillators, <coughs> the Z and the W oscillators, which have five components each. The translation generator is the JM plus uh, part of this SO23. Then we define this derivative like that. Uh, also, that's very uh, that's con conventional. And uh, you can try to open up the system that I wrote before. Uh, if you want to make manifest GL5 covariance, then you introduce a null vector here, which you can fix to be null, to be non-zero only in the plus direction of your frame, adapted frame, so that this one form uh, connection is effectively only, and I take flat space here um, to change from the previous part just for simplification, but the point is that all this formalism allows to go to any conformally flat background. So that's really the, also one advantage. Okay, so this is the system that you can write, but still, uh, that's fine, but you would like to recognize some tensors that you have heard about, like maybe the Scouten tensor, where it sits, and how to make it uh, explicit. Um, so it turns out that indeed going to GL5 is useful so for technical reasons because then you can recognize this double tower of connections and I will present the spectrum which is uh, the spectrum of the Pope Townsend theory but we, that we have just rearranged in terms of GL3 valued potentials. So maybe it's a bit, <laughs> okay, well, that, that's not so important anyway. But for detailed anal analysis in the spin three case, there is this very nice paper of Bengt, Nielsen, and Linander here. So here we have provided a different set of one forms, but that contain the same spectrum. So just the same equation, but written differently, actually. So it's a, some work to write down what, is the, what are the equations in terms of GL3 fields, but in fact, it's not so complicated here. By hand, for spin S, you can do it. While well, Bank knows that it's quite tough to manipulate conformal spin, uh, spin S in three dimensions, usually conformal um, um, symbolic manipulation is required. Uh, well, still here some, thing, some things could be done by hand, but it's free, of course. Bank looked at interacting systems, which is much more uh, challenging. So just to finish, the Scouten tensor now sits inside one of the connections that we have presented and satisfies, we have shown all the properties that you, you know and that people have listed, in particular Mark and his students, and we discussed about that this week. You recover all that sitting in various places inside your module. But, uh, that, and I, this is my last slide. Uh, the Carton formulation makes the whole uh, cohomological analysis of Mark and his students quite uh, automatic now. Well, there was a price to pay, but now it pays off. Because if you introduce this connection, which is a background connection plus the spin S conformal uh, connection, so the background solves the zero curvature equation. The unfolded set of equations that I presented in the previous slides can be written in this compact form here. 
So if you said that the cotton is zero and the co cotton tensor is this uh, zero form, the primary zero form, well, then the connection, this big connection W is flat. So you can find a gauge function which makes it explicit. You decompose it into a gauge function for the background part plus the piece in the spin S uh, ideal. And you take an infinitesimal gauge function here. So the vanishing of the cotton immediately tells you that the spin S connection is pure gauge. And in particular, if you look at the conformal weight, which is uh, well, S minus one, you recognize that the, scot the skeleton tensor is pure gauge. Uh, so that's, and conversely, if the connection is uh, pure gauge, well, it means that W is flat and then cotton is zero. So that was one problem that is very easy to analyze in terms of the unfolded formulation. And I thank you for your attention. Yeah, and that was uh, and no black holes and linear eyes. I apologize again. But okay, let, let let me at least ask a question. So um, in the in the spin two case, you can uh, combine the TMG and the NMG uh, terms uh, to get this generalized massive gravity, and then you get uh, uh, a new type of Jordan block where it's not the uh, stress tensor that acquires a logarithmic partner, but one of the massive modes. Uh, is there some straightforward high spin generalization of that? So. Well, in other words, can you combine the, your TMG and your NMG generalization? Uh, yes, some, so uh, maybe I went too quickly, but there was the gener generalization of the generalized massive gravity. Okay, yes. Uh, yes, well, yeah, that went a bit fast. Uh -huh. And yes. there you find also these Jordan the blocks where the massive modes can degenerate with each other. Yes, yes, yes okay. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but any other but yeah. here, no matter field, huh? everything was pure, pure gauge sure. system, no equivalent of stress tensor uh, sure. for matter. Mm -hmm. uh, Stefan? Start over. So uh, in pure TMG, just uh, spin two TMG, you have this special point where, okay, people have been discussing about chiral gravity is there, uh, well, where the, the, the Virazo, I mean, the two dimensional conformal Virazo algebra collapses to one copy of Virazo algebra. So do you have, do you have something special happening at this, this special point, like mu L is equals to one in your case? Well, yeah, th there was those critical points when you had the, um, well, you have a, a, an ideal which was appearing I think that that corresponds to, to those, those critical points. If you take, in this, in this case, S prime, which is S plus one, you leave an ideal uh, behind. So you effectively start at spin, which is effectively greater than what you thought. You believe, in fact, you effectively describe a system which propagates spin S prime and not spin S. So here, in this case, it's one unit above what you, is it answering? Part of your question, or? I, I see where, um, okay, and then if you go to the, so there is another kind of critical point, is if you take a mu which saturates the uni unitarity bound, then you don't propagate anything. It's a singleton, it's the spin S singleton. It only leaves at the boundary. And obviously, well, Strominger's and well, collaborators played with that just to have the black hole uh, unitary, well, correct energy design, but then to kill indeed the, the spin S, the spin two bulk mode, which was non unitary, but now it is killed because it's effectively a singleton. It leaves at, at the boundary. And you have the spin S there mm -hmm. at the lean rise level, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, let's thank Nicola again. Thank you. Thank you. And well, as the last chairman, let me also take this opportunity on behalf of, I think, all of us to thank the organizers uh, for the whole program and